Hello, everyone. My guest today is Josh Montgomery. He's the founder and CEO of Mycroft, the privacy-focused open-source voice assistant. Josh has more than 15 years of entrepreneurial experience to bring up uh, br- to bring to Mycroft. He previously built one of the few gigabit fiber networks from scratch in the United States. Josh, are you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, I'm really excited. Which community did you build this fiber network in? Uh, Lawrence, Kansas, adjacent to the University of Kansas and right next door to Google Fiber. Very easier or more difficult than you thought? Uh, it's a very, very challenging thing to build, especially in light of how uh, weighted the market is towards incumbents. Yep. And now let's transfer this into what you're currently working on. How does this relate to Mycroft? Sure. So a few years ago, we realized that we had the freedom to do whatever we wanted to do with our time. And we decided to spend our time sharing our experience with other entrepreneurs. So we opened up an entrepreneurship center that included co-working, a makerspace and a data center. And we wanted to put Jarvis from Iron Man or the Star Trek computer in the space. And <laughs> at the time, Echo didn't exist. Uh, Google Assistant didn't exist. Siri was locked up on the iPhone. And so we set out to build an open technology that allowed us to replicate that experience. Now, when you say open, I mean, literally open source code? Yes, everything in the entire technology stack is open uh, end to end, uh, including uh, sometime early next year, the entire back end, uh, which will allow people at big companies or um, at an individual residence to deploy a whole voice assistant. So it's open source. Are you making money from this? Have you found a way to monetize? Oh, yeah. We've been selling smart speakers since before Google made it cool. And uh, we continue to uh, sell that product as well as providing a licensed backend infrastructure for big corporate players. And uh, we're, I was going to say, sorry, before you move forward, if you break down those two revenue streams, the physical software versus the backend licensing, is it 50-50 or is one way bigger? Uh, today, it's the consumer product uh, is bigger. You know, we're very, very early in our development process. Uh, if you look at what Amazon built, they spent uh, nearly four years, made three acquisitions and spent $150 million before their Super ad, Super Bowl ad in 2016. Uh, we're still somewhere. You're talking about for Alexa. Yeah, for Alexa. Yeah. And so uh, we focus very heavily on makers and hackers and developers. Um, we actively discourage general consumers from adopting our technology today. Uh, that'll change next year. Uh, but right now we're really happy with the 22,000 developers and, and hackers and makers that are using our product. So I want to talk more about, again, how you have built this ecosystem around uh, the concept. But first, put this on a timeline for me. So when did it launch? Uh, so we launched our Kickstarter in uh, September of 2015. Okay. Uh, uh, joined Techstars that uh, winter um, in Kansas City. Went on into a small angel round, 350,000 in 2016. Uh, then we joined 500 startups and took a strategic from Jaguar Land Rover in early 2017. Uh, raised a two million dollar seed, which closed in January of this year, and we're now in the final stages of closing a Series A. Uh, which will let us take it to the next level. Okay, so including the A you're about to close, how much total capital in the company? If you include the A, it's going to be about eight and a half million with five of that coming here in the next few months. Okay, got it. Very good. So eight and a half million and uh, you launched, sorry, I didn't catch the date. You launched in, you said 2015? Yeah, 2015, we did the Kickstarter, nothing but a a prayer and a dream. Uh, You know, I think one of the big things that entrepreneurs miss when they're launching products, and and I think it's the biggest waste in the entrepreneur ecosystem, is to determine whether or not anybody wants your product. And so we we started with a Kickstarter with nothing but a video to see if people wanted a smart speaker because there were a lot of very experienced venture capital folks and and other entrepreneurs out there who said, nobody's ever going to want this smart speaker thing. Like it listens in the corner. That's a niche market. And of course, that that doesn't turn out to be the case. It, it turns out it's the fastest growing segment of the fastest growing market in history. Yep. Now, 2,245 folks backed you in that campaign and you raised, I think, about $394,000. Did you deliver everything that people pre-ordered? Uh, that was our first campaign was 127,000, a, a smaller number of backers, 1,120. Um, we ran a second campaign uh, early this year. And uh, that's actually at, I think, about 490000 We took it over to Indiegogo. Uh, we plan on delivering those products in December of this year. And as it stands now, we're on schedule. That's great. So when you look at when you look at the consumer side of this, and obviously your cost structure on a physical product, the margins are going to be lower than obviously a licensed backend pure software play. Uh, re- remind me again, are, do you have these larger enterprise brands spending more on the backend licensing or more on you know buying 100 of these units to spread through their offices? Uh, it's more of the back end licensing. So the idea is to allow people to bring a custom voice assistant to any product line. So in Jaguar Land Rover's case, the discussions have centered around the vehicle. Uh, in other companies' cases, it's around smart speakers or apps. 
Um, the piece where we bring value is when they want to deploy at scale. Uh, you could look at our business model like we give away free beer. If you want a glass, it's free. If you want a keg, we charge you. Interesting. Um, do you, on the licensing model, like give me, a, help me get my mind around that, that model. What's like the average customer pay per month for that? Um, our cost structure is scheduled, structured around $1,500 a month for a license. That'll serve about 5,000 users. Um, and so that can scale with a number of licenses that an enterprise needs. Um, we've been working with a couple companies on that, but we don't have any any significant sales to report there yet. Uh, most of our revenue so far has come from the maker hacker community that we've been targeting. The physical stuff. So, yeah, the physical stuff. How So how do you, if someone's listening right now, they're thinking, okay, he's got a niche market in kind of the hacker community. Those hackers are like anti-job. Very rarely are you going to find them in corporate development at Jaguar, right? Or, or, or these big enterprise folks you're selling on the licensing model. I mean, aren't these two like very different things and why not just go all in on one? Actually, it turns out, well, because an open source community first needs community, but it, it turns out that there's a lot of uh, big companies out there that want to make use of the open source software stack and dedicate resources to it. So uh, for example, we found full-time employees at Cisco Systems that are spending their entire day working on the Mycroft stack so that they can bring that technology into the parent company. And, and that's really how the bigger open source communities thrive is with full-time developers who are paid by whatever XYZ corporation to develop the technology going forward. So that person in, that, in, in Cisco will, will commit new code and grow the, the open source thing as well, not just hackers in their basement fooling around with the hardware from the Indiegogo campaign. Oh, absolutely. And then they bring it to their manager and then you know the manager looks at it and says, okay, well, if we're going to deploy this into production, we need you know, support and licensing and other things. And that's really what drives the sales. I mean, if you think about it this way, that, you know, voice is such a big thing and all of these companies need to get it. And, you know, their choices today are either pass all of your data and all of your consumer information to Google or Amazon, who may be a competitor 10 minutes from now, um, or you have this open source solution that you can bring in house and customize and not have to build the entire thing yourself. Yeah. What I'm trying to figure out is your growth model. So like we recently, because you have a, you, oh, I've only interviewed maybe five people that have, um, at scale, the hardware component, which is usually subsidized with a phys, with a, with a licensed software product on the back end. So this is purple Wi-Fi comes to mind. Eero comes to mind. They're about to break a hundred million bucks there. They've raised over a hundred million bucks. Uh, not to say raising is obviously the key to success, but I'm trying to understand how your hardware model subsidizes and subsidizes and helps grow the licensing model. And what I'm hearing you say, is the physical objects are almost like an incentive to developers to contribute more lines of code to the open stack, which makes the license more valuable. Yeah. And then also our hardware is open. So big corporates that want to deploy a smart speaker can take our hardware and produce it in volume and ship it uh, without having to design their own hardware. So the, the PCB that's inside there can be wrapped in new plastics and uh, put under their brand or shipped in their stores. So let's keep going down the Cisco model if we can. I don't, I don't understand what you just said. So g give me an example. And again, if you can use Cisco, what would they, do? let's say they keep going with you. What would they use? What's a product they would ship that's built on you? So let's skip Cisco and go to a retailer, somebody who might, comp who might uh, compete head to head with Amazon. So Amazon, Amazon's strategy is very clearly to take the speaker, move it into the kitchen and make it possible for you to buy products without ever getting a screen. Standing in your kitchen and saying, I need a dozen eggs, a gallon of milk and a, a cup of butter. Um, and then having that show up from a local Amazon distribution plant in less than an hour, right? So by the time you're done cooking the recipe, your groceries are, are at the door or by the time you're done doing food prep. Well, that's a really significant challenge to other retailers in the space. You know, um, companies like Walmart and Target and Carrefour on a global level really can't compete with that. And so, you know, we provide companies like that and, of course, electronic makers and others with the ability to deploy a smart speaker, the ability to deploy this technology in their apps without having to build it from scratch. And then when they want to deploy it at scale, you know, um, Walmart, for example, has 3,400 stores. You know, should they deploy this at scale, they'll need dozens and dozens and dozens of licenses. That's where we can help. Is there a different, so what you just told me was tied, like that's only valuable, obviously, that exact example, if people have tons of distribution channels and their goal is to, you know, take a physical, an order in the kitchen and deliver quickly, Walmart, I could see doing that. But give me an example that's not tied to someone having a lot of distribution plants all across the country or world. Sure. So voice makes a lot of sense in, for instance, a security context. So if you have a router that has a series of really complex firewall rules, 
you know, you can either have your uh, security admin go in there and add a whole bunch of complex rules about blocking ports or whatever, whatever, or they can say, hey, I want you to block all ports. I want you to open port 80 and port 443 to the web server. I want you to open port 25 to the to the email server and uh, report to this email address if there are any security intrusion attempts. And being able to do that with voice or being able to do that uh, with a conversational interface, maybe through a text bot, um, is really valuable to those companies as they continue to develop products that communicate naturally using human language instead of using programmatic language that oh, requires a lot of specialized expertise. So, so a security company might use this internally with their 300 developers in their in their dev center in San Fran to, to like speed up development because they can do it via talking instead of typing. Exactly. And, you know, if you think about it the way you and I communicate, you're like, yes, we can text back and forth. But when humans have the ability to meet face to face and to have a conversation, that's clearly the most effective way for us to communicate. Uh, if a meteor is about to hit you in the head, I don't send you a text message. I say duck. Right. And so that type of interface is coming in the future. Uh, in the voice market, it's not the first inning of the game. It is literally the first at bat. This technology is so early. You could think of voice technology like computer technology in the late 1970s. Uh, the future of this technology looks like a full-blown natural conversation between you and your technology where your technology represents you to the internet and acts seamlessly on your behalf. And that's the type of interface that not just Amazon and Google are seeking, but thousands and thousands of large corporations around the world. And you're hoping to get their business in terms of using your open stack. Exactly. So yeah. we want our target is any business that views Apple, Amazon and Google as a potential competitor. And given that Google's making self-driving cars and Amazon is launching spaceships, that's a really broad category of businesses. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very interesting. What are the risks to this? Why would this not work? Uh, so th there's risks surrounding uh, building open technologies from the standpoint of building the perception in the market that free means low quality. Um, you know, that's something that we work or really security hard. or security risk. I would actually argue the opposite. The, the idea that you can take apart the lock to the front door, examine all the components and verify that only your key will fit makes it much more secure than putting a lock on the front door that's magic inside and you find out that somebody can pick it with a paperclip. Um, transparency really does breed security. Your so explanation I, I, would convince me there, by the way, but I'm saying if someone else is looking for a solution like this, I feel like security is going to be their first question. They're going to think open source and go, oh, I can't use the open source thing. If, if the Russians get into this, we're screwed. Yeah, but the open source powers the whole internet, right? Almost every web server, every router, all of the equipment, the software that we're talking through right now uh, is powered by open source technologies. And uh, and that really has been the kind of the the pace of technology going all the way back to the beginning. You know, you have a couple of proprietary stacks stand up and eventually open source steps in and, and starts to take over that market. You know, when we went in the data center, for example, when we went from um, mainframes to x86, Red Hat became a dominant player. Now Linux dominates the data center. For dynamic content, WordPress, the open source alternative, is now dominates the market. And mobile, Android's 90% of the market with 2.2 billion installs because it's open source. So open is a strategy to get broad adoption and support more than uh, really an instant monetization strategy. Yeah, the I mean, side of that coin you named a lot of to monetize. Yeah, you named a lot of success stories, but there, there are, I would say for every success, maybe a thousand that, that just failed miserably. I mean, look, we had Matt on the show and he admitted, I mean, the most difficult thing for him at WordPress was convincing, you know, when his community saw on TechCrunch, WordPress, you know, WordPress passes a hundred million revenue and the open source community sees that and they go, what the hell? Like, how, why is he making all this money? We have no part of it. We're contributing to the code base. Same question to you in five years from now, if you, you know, same TechCrunch article, how does your open source community react? Well, you make a really fantastic case and we actually have already addressed that. So right now we're running a campaign on startengine.com. I can't talk about the details because SEC rules, but it allows anybody to invest in our company all the way down to $250. And so the mechanism that we built is allowed our developers and our community to own a piece of the company that they're developing outside of the tradition, traditional public ec or traditional private equity markets that have driven a lot of other companies in the past. So a financial win for us is a financial win for the community. Interesting. So if there is someone in the open source community right now spending 30% of their day coding on you after their day job, they could actually go say, you know what, let me put up 250 bucks or whatever they want via, what was it, startengine.com? Yeah, be a start engine and, and become an investor in Microsoft. Interesting. And there, it's actual equity. 
yeah, we've got, uh, I think the last count was 680 investors there, um, in addition to some of the private equity we've raised through uh, private offerings in the past. That's amazing. Uh, are you, I don't know what you're allowed to talk about or not. Can you say how much you've raised so far through Start Engine? Uh, somebody can step to the site and, and have a look. I need to be super careful because the SEC requires you to do all of the communications about the campaign through the platform. So I can point people at startengine.com and, and have them search for Mycroft. And you could talk about it. I can't. I was going to say, I'm doing it right now. So if I read what you've raised, is that, is that okay? I think it might be a red flag. Maybe we should, okay. we should stay I, away from I won't, it. I won't do it then, but I can tell you guys, I'm looking at the numbers right now. It's actually very impressive. So th- there, there's an open loop for you. Go, ch- go check it out. Startengine.com and just search Mycroft. M Y C R O F T. Um, talk to me just quick at a, not about your campaign, but start engine in general, easy to work with. I mean, is this, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I think this is like one of these more legit kind of crowdfunding with the new regulations kind of platforms. I mean, has it worked well for you? I think it has. I, I think to be successful at raising money through a proud, a, a crowdfunding platform uh, like this, uh, you really do have to have a community around the company. I think going in there cold uh, would be a mistake. Um, it does allow you to raise small amounts of money, so like 10000 So if you have a company that really doesn't require a lot of capital or a very simple idea you're chasing, I think it would be a good fit. Uh, for most people, if you're building a hardware product or a video game, I think that perks-based crowdfunding is probably a better fit because it, it does have a much, much broader uh, audience. Very good. All right, Josh, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? I've been reading the four recently. It gives me a lot of insight into the folks I'm competing with. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Oh, yeah. I love following Elon Musk despite the the recent crazy. <laughs> Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building a business? Uh, my favorite online tool for building a business is probably Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Number mm-hmm. four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Eight. And what's I have your, a great team. Yeah, that's pretty good. And what's your situation? Married, single kids? I am married with two kids, traveling full time for a year. I love that. And how old are you? I am forty. And how old are the kiddos? Are they super young? Nine and ten. They're with wow. their teacher right now here in Paris, touring the sites. That's awesome. Okay. And last question: What do you wish your twenty-year-old self knew? I wish my twenty-year-old self had packed up and gone to work for SpaceX when he had the opportunity. <laughs> Did you? Uh, yeah, I, I had two job offers from NASA, and SpaceX was kind of beginning at that time, so it was a real opportunity, and I just. I went a different direction. Oh, different direction. Guys, there you have it. Josh, mycroft.ai launched in 2015 on a uh, crowdfunding and and then switched over to Indiegogo. Did very, very well. Uh, Today focused on, again, the voice space, but he's not attacking it from, say, you know, a hardware perspective necessarily. Short term, yes, but long term, it's really about this open source tech stack that allows really anyone that sees Google or Amazon or these guys as a competitor. They can plug in in a very unbiased open source way and still get a lot of that value. Josh, thank you so much for taking us to the top. Hey, thanks for the time, Nathan.